Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Welcome back to Dark Poutine. Uh, I, I forgot who I was there for a second. I'm Mike Brown, and this is Matthew Stockton. You need another coffee. I need, I think I need like coffee on tap in this room. <laughs> it would help maybe a little. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate, Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. Takeaway available. On the morning of December 31st, 1888, on a small island off the French-controlled islands of St. pierre Miquelon, friends found 61-year-old fisherman Francois Coupard dead in his fishing shack. Someone had brutally slain Coupard and had mutilated his body horribly after his murder. A quick investigation led to two men, Auguste Neal and Louis Olivier. They were trying to flee to Newfoundland on Coupard's stolen fishing boat. The pair quickly admitted their roles in the murder and were tried and convicted. Olivier was sentenced to 10 years at hard labor, while Neil, against whom the evidence was more solid, received a death sentence, which was carried out on August 24, 1889. This execution was the first and last in North America using a guillotine to do the deed. You are listening to Dark Poutine, episode 221, Murder on the Isle of Dogs, the execution of Auguste Neil. The island where the crime had been committed, now called L'Ile de Haut Marine, was known then as Ile aux Chiens, Isle of Dogs. It is a small fishing commune belonging to the French remnant colony Saint Pierre Miquelon off the southern coast of Newfoundland. The island archipelago that makes up Saint Pierre Miquelon lie just a ferry ride from the small community of Fortune, Newfoundland. It is the only remaining piece of French territory in North America. So if you want to travel, technically, to France, you can easily do so without actually leaving the continent. Sometimes Newfoundlanders will see a European license plate in the southern parts of the province as residents of St. Pierre and Miquelon make their way to Newfoundland from their islands to visit and shop. St. Pierre and Miquelon has no railway and only 114 kilometers of highways plus 45 kilometers of unpaved roads. Its only major harbour is St. Pierre. The dependency has no merchant marine and two airports. French patriotism is strong in the islands, and the islanders are proud that some of the soil in the island is French, having been brought over in the ballasts of ships. So this is technically an away game episode. We're, we're all the way in France. Well, it's not technically an away <laughs> game because it takes place 20 kilometres from Newfoundland, which is now part of Canada. Mm-hmm. And the bad guys were trying to escape to Newfoundland, so okay, not an away game. Okay, I yeah, I, like uh, <laughs> anything that involves Canada in any way, uh, in even in passing, it's is not an away game. It's not an away game. <laughs> A Canadian once visited this country. <laughs> yes, exactly. The Canadian Encyclopedia.ca writes that the islands were likely discovered around 1520 
by Portuguese navigator Joao Alvarez Fagundes, and they were claimed formally for France by Jacques Cartier 14 years later. They were originally settled by 30 Basque and Norman fishermen in 1604. According to NewfoundlandLabrador.com, the territory changed hands between the British and French as they fought their territorial wars numerous times after its original colonization. Quote, Originally a French settlement, the British took control of the islands in 1713, 1778, 1794, 1803, and 1815, with the French taking back possession between each of these occupations. Eventually, the French took control of the islands once again in 1816, this time permanently. End quote. During the alcohol prohibition era of the 1920s, the islands were used to smuggle alcohol into the United States by rum runners. Even the most famous rum running mobster, Al Capone, visited the islands. You know, I think <laughs> this might sound weird, mm -hmm. but I think Al Capone had a strong work ethic. Oh, he probably did. He was like... He's, he was everywhere all the time. Yeah, he was like the Elon Musk of bad guys. <laughs> Although some people would say Elon Musk is a bad guy too, but... I have no opinion. Okay. <laughs> also, according to NewfoundlandLabrador.com, if time travel is your thing, the ferry to the islands travels through time zones. Quote, Newfoundland is known for its quirky 30-minute time zone, but St. Pierre and Miquelon is something else entirely. They, too, have their own time zone, this one being 30 minutes ahead of Newfoundland time. So, at noon in Newfoundland, it's 12.30 p.m. in St. Pierre, 11.30 a.m. in Halifax, and 10.30 a.m. in Toronto. Technically, this makes St. Pierre and Miquelon the first place in North America to celebrate the New Year. This unique time zone provides an interesting quirk, since you have to travel west by ferry from Fortune to reach St. Pierre. It's one of the few time zones on Earth that will force you to set your watch ahead as you travel west. Oh my gosh, my brain is spinning. Kind of like traveling on the Concorde. Yeah. Like the Concorde, you'd arrive in New York 15 minutes before you left London. Yeah. Like with the time zones. Yeah, it's so, pretty crazy. Yeah. And there's a new... Uh, supersonic, uh, there's a new supersonic jet company that's just about to start. So, uh, yeah. Are they going to use that Jim Iroquois song for their theme? Jim Miroquois? Yeah. Which song is that? Supersonic. My love is supersonic. And we have to pay Jim Miroquois money with, <laughs> so he can dance around his dumb hat. No, that, that was, yeah. <laughs> I like this hat. He was good. Not everybody thinks that. Okay. It is a unique place in North America for sure, and I'd love to travel there one day, but I'll be making sure my travel insurance is up to snuff, and I won't be riding a bike there, as our friend Vicky badly broke her foot while visiting a few years ago. She went through no small amount of hassle afterward. True crime buffs will recognize 1888 as the year that old Jack the Ripper was murdering women in the Whitechapel neighborhood of London, where I'll be going in July. Also that year, National Geographic published its first magazine. Queen Victoria had celebrated her 51st year on the British throne, and Vincent van Gogh cut off the lower part of his left ear, later taking it to a brothel before being hospitalized in Arles, France. On St. Pierre and Miquelon, the lucrative cod fishing industry on the nearby Grand Banks was booming. Since 1866, 4,000 French fishermen were coming annually from St. Malo, France to fish in a fleet of more than 200 schooners. You forgot to mention the Great Sheep Panic of 1888. The what? 8 p.m., November the 3rd in Oxfordshire. Did they even know the time? Yeah. Oh. Thousands, so uh, over a 520 square kilometer area, which mm -hmm. is big, right? Yes, yep. All the sheep thousands of them at once freaked out like in on a simultaneous impulse and all like battered down the um fences they were in or got loose and went into hiding everywhere wow so there were sheep like all over the place yeah they were hiding under bushes they were like huddled in corners of fields maybe they'd read the papers about jack the ripper i don't know maybe they were afraid maybe or maybe it was like a ufo could have been your little story about the sheep panic reminds me of my friend Rick, uh, who's who's 
passed away. He used to work down around the port of Vancouver. And <laughs> he said one time there was a, an 18 wheeler full of chickens that tipped over and all the chickens got loose. And he said for months they were just finding chickens running around, wow. <laughs> running around on, on Powell Street down, down in Vancouver. Really? Just like... You know, you'd be walking to the store and here's a chicken running. <laughs> wow. Urban chickens. <laughs> Urban chickens. <laughs> On the evening of December 30th, 1888, the closest neighbors of Francois Coupards, the Juans, heard what they assumed to be a loud and extended drunken party and perhaps a fight in Coupards' home. The commotion with all the yelling and banging had kept them up into the wee hours. It wasn't the first time the couple's sleep had been interrupted by Coupard's drunken reverie with who they thought might be the other man who was mate on Coupard's fishing boat and sometimes stayed in the shack, a 35-year-old, quote, simple-minded fella named Louis Olivier. It was the first time, though, that there had appeared to be a fight. Olivier and Coupard were known to have gotten on very well. In the morning, all was quiet, and knocks on the door went unanswered. So the couple decided to go and talk to the gendarmes to file a complaint and ask the officers to look in on Coupard. You imagine the couple. We move all the way from France to this tiny island in the coast of, off the coast of the New World and we still get noisy neighbors. Yeah. Right? Well, yeah. <laughs> noisy neighbors suck. They do. They really, really suck. <laughs> I have been a noisy neighbor in the past. Have you? Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. My, the, the people who lived next door to mom and dad used to complain to mom and dad that when they were away, Michael listens to his music very, very loudly. <laughs> well, I th see, I think everyone's allowed the occasional loud party or the occasional loud music. Like once every three weeks, I probably blare my music a little bit too loud for the neighbors downstairs, but it's once every three weeks at about four o'clock and it's good music. Oh, it's good music. Yeah. For everybody? Is it, would everybody think it's good music? No. Well, I have good taste in music. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Two police constables went to Coupard's house right away to help ease the minds of Mr. and Mrs. Juan. The gendarmes noticed the window was broken and the door had been damaged as well but they did not notice anything otherwise abnormal after taking a quick peek inside. They called out for Coupard, but there was no answer. They thought that maybe the man and Olivia had simply gone elsewhere to ring in the new year, or perhaps they'd gone fishing, as Coupard's boat was missing. At around 2 p.m. that same day, two other men, friends of Coupard's, arrived at the shack to borrow a pair of boots. As they entered... They too noticed the broken window, and it appeared as though the door had also been kicked in. They too called out to Coupard as they came inside, receiving no reply. Right away, the pair noted that the shack was in a state of disarray not typical for Coupard. Something felt off. The men looked around. They noticed a heap laying under a sail in the corner of the shack. When they pulled back the canvas, they screamed out as they were met with a horrific, unexpected sight the mutilated body of their friend, Francois Coupard. The men ran to notify the authorities. The gendarmes returned, as did a representative from the public prosecutor's office, all the way from St. Pierre. The local physician, Dr. Camail, was there too to examine and note the state of the body. According to St. Pierre et Michelon.net, the corpse had been placed between two chests and packed into a ball, Francois's head was folded over his chest and his legs bent under his abdomen. When the police moved the body, the true horror of what had been done to him quickly became evident. None of the men present had ever seen anything close to the sight that now assailed them. Coupard had been partially butchered. Above his right breast there were three incisions about three centimeters long. Three similar incisions were evident above his left breast. What was left of Coupard's throat was a gaping wound that had penetrated all the way down to his heart, which had been removed. The captain's sternum had been split in its middle part as if to divide the trunk into two parts. The fully perforated belly let out the intestines. In the inguinal part, two very deep symmetrical sections indicated that the legs had been detached from the torso. Other unspeakable mutilations were also noted. Undoubtedly, 
the murderer or murderers, pressed for time or for fear of being discovered, had not been able to complete their butchery, throwing the corpse where it was and having covered it with a sail, they'd fled, seizing everything of value that could be taken away. That's all really extreme. It really is. I, I'm just picturing this little island and all of a sudden all this stuff happened. This horror. Yeah. Olivier, wherever he was, had a lot of questions to answer, but he was nowhere to be found. And to no one's shock at all, as Coupard's boat was not at the wharf where it usually sat, he fell under immediate suspicion. It was an easy deduction from that point that Olivier and perhaps an accomplice had stolen the boat and made for the English coast of Newfoundland around 20 kilometers away. Gendarmes began to search for Olivier around the village, asking known acquaintances when they'd last seen him. On Monday evening, they learned that Olivier had been seen the day before with an individual named Auguste Neal, and that both had been drinking heavily in the two small cabarets of Ilo Chien until around 10 o'clock that evening. Neal, a 38-year-old fisherman, was a familiar figure in those spots, known for his drunkenness and a nasty disposition. He was also known to board with a man named Roulon in St. Pierre. On the 1st of January, 1889, the police went to the Roulon residence and asked when Mr. Roulon had last seen Olivier. The officers learned that Neil had returned the day before from ile chien around 8 o'clock in the morning. Around the same time, the Juin couple were reporting the drunken row that they'd heard the night before at Coupard's. When Neil came home, he was with a man unknown to Roulon, but his description fit exactly that of Louis Olivier. They'd gathered up some of Neil's things and left the boarding house at 2 o'clock in the afternoon after asking other residents to come and help them push a fishing boat, Coupards, that they'd drunkenly stranded on rocks nearby. The police were now quite afraid that the suspected murderers had been able to escape to Newfoundland, as they'd first assumed. It would be interjurisdictional at that point. However, that evening, only hours after the police first visited Roulon's home, Neil and Olivier stumbled drunkenly through the door. Police were notified that the pair had returned. Gendarme Paul Coupard rushed to the house and arrested the pair without incident. It's unclear whether the officer was related to Francois Coupard, the murder victim. Most likely, wouldn't you think? You would think. I mean, the population now is like, what, 5,000, imagine, and 18. Well, it was pretty busy place. I mean, yeah. there was cabarets everywhere and, you know, like, I don't know. I don't think they were big cabarets like you would see in Vancouver or London, but they were big enough to warrant mention. Okay. The pair admitted they had, in fact, tried to make it to Newfoundland. Also likely hampered by their extreme drunkenness, the waters of the angry North Atlantic had been whipped into a frenzy by a nasty, cold, easterly wind which had prevented them from making a clean getaway. The pair had been blown right back towards St. Pierre and abandoned Francois's boat at anne a henri in the north side of the island. Freezing and wet, they'd broken into an abandoned fishing hut and rang in the new year there, getting some much-needed rest. Imagine being as pissed as a newt and trying to navigate a boat in the North Atlantic in December. Well, I don't know about December, because I, do, I don't think I've ever been drunk in trying to navigate a boat in December, but... <laughs> but in June, yes. Yes. <laughs> really? Oh my gosh. Uh, my friend John and I one time decided, let's go to Indian Island. And so Indian Island is an island in the Atlantic off the La Have River in Nova Scotia, and... There are rocks all around the island, like big rocks. Mm -hmm. It's barren and uninhabited. Uh, it was a really foggy day, so we couldn't see where we were going, number one. Right. And we decided, well, let's just get hammered and go have a walk oh. around Indian Island. So somehow we navigated from buoy to buoy and, and <laughs> ended up dragging onto the shore of Indian Island. And it's, it's just this barren, rocky island with a few trees and lots of junk. Mm. So all this junk from fishing boats and... It and washes up. Just washes up. It's just sort of a, a place that gathers all these things. And uh, we used to measure our walks in a weird way. So we decided we would walk around the island and see how long it takes. And the way we measured it is in beer. So it took three and a half beer to get around the okay. island. Yeah. So we were very drunk, and looking back, I was thinking... You're lucky you survived your childhood. I am. 
<laughs> On January 1st, they'd walk the three kilometers or so down the snowy Guidon Road south into the city of St. Pierre. They stopped at a number of drinking establishments along the way back to Roland's boarding house. Immediately after their arrest on suspicion of murder and a brief interrogation, police dragged Neil and Olivier back to the scene of the crime, Francois Coupard's shack. There, after being confronted with the sight of Coupard's corpse, the pair confessed to the crime. When asked why they'd butchered Francois the way they had, still drunk, they didn't have a coherent answer, at that time saying only they wanted to, quote, see if Coupard was fat. The pair were held for trial, while the locals, having heard the details of the heinous crime, called for their heads for the murder of Captain Coupard. And we'll take a break right here. And we're back. Matthew, do you have any thoughts on this story and the elements that we've heard so far? There's this weird break between sort of the landscape and the fact that it's a small town and everyone probably knows of each other with this murder and mutilation. Mm -hmm. That seems totally senseless. Like I, I, there's been no re no real reason. You're right. Other than maybe like some fishing poles or something mm -hmm. that this would have happened. Right. It's just strange. It is strange. Yeah. It is the middle of nowhere. I mean, my birth family on my birth father's side, I just recently learned, is from a small island called Ramia. Okay. And if mm -hmm. it's very, it's actually quite close to St. Pierre and Miquelon. Okay. So, uh, and Ramia is very, very, very tiny little place. Yeah. So uh, it, it does not look like a place that would be friendly to the human if you know what yeah, I mean. Yeah, yeah. you've got it. In, in winter, anyway. You have to survive. Yeah, it's like uh, you'd have to be a rough and ready person to want to move to a place like that. When the trial began on Tuesday, February 8th, 1889, the courtroom was packed with people wanting to get the official version of the story and to see justice brought to the monsters, Neil and Olivier. The details of their confessions were given into evidence. At about 10 o'clock in the evening on December 30th, 1888, Olivier and Neil, already drunk, had planned dinner at Coupard's. The pair were angered to find the shack was in darkness and the door closed and locked. They kicked in the door and broke the only window of the hut. When they entered and found themselves face to face with Coupard, who they claimed had a knife in his hand, which he'd grabbed after being awakened when his door was bashed in. Coupard was livid and a scuffle began between Olivier and Francois. Olivier eventually gained physical control of the wily old fisherman and was trying to calm him down. So let me get this right. You're going to a friend's house for dinner. Yeah. It doesn't look like he's home, so you kick his door in. Well, it's where uh, Olivier was staying. Right. So Olivier boarded there. Okay. Uh, from time to time. It, it isn't clear whether he was at this point, but right. but yeah, you're going over, you want to go in for dinner and, and hang out. And it's like, oh, nobody's home. Let's kick the door in. Well, they're drunk, right? Yeah. And it's like, oh yeah, like, well, okay, if you're going to lock the door, we're going to kick it down. It, I think that was the thinking. And then surprise, surprise, this guy's at home. It's 10 o'clock at night. Maybe he's tired, having a nap, or maybe even gone to bed. Yeah. And you're awakened by these two drunken creeps breaking into your house, and it's dark. You don't know who it is. Yeah. Seeing Olivier had things in hand, Neil then knocked the knife out of Coupard's hand and had picked it up himself. Auguste Neil then yelled, Better to kill the devil than the devil kills you. And he plunged the sharp knife deep into Coupard's chest. Neil and Olivier lit a candle to survey the scene and leaned over Coupard to see if he was still breathing. At that point, Neil handed Olivier the knife and said it was time for him to take his turn stabbing Coupard, which Olivier did, driving the blade into Coupard's belly. Olivier claimed that Francois was dead already by the time he stabbed him, making Neil the murderer. Neil pointed the finger right back at Olivier claiming that Coupard was still breathing, but barely, when Olivier stabbed him. After the murder, Neil began to mutilate the corpse while Olivier watched. 
Neil opened Coupard's chest with a knife they'd used to murder the old man and pulled out Francois's heart, exclaiming, What a big heart! After that, Neil and Olivier took turns butchering Francois and cut off his legs, sticking to their ridiculous story that they simply wanted to see how fat he was. Police, however, testified that they assumed, probably correctly, that the two men had wanted to dismember Francois to make his body parts smaller for concealment and transportation to the old man's fishing boat for disposal at sea. Neil and Olivier denied this motive for the mutilation. Yeah, you don't need to cut somebody's heart out to make the body easier to transport. So no. I agree it probably wasn't the motive. Mm -hmm. Though I would have been more comfortable with somebody saying that was the motive because it's more sensical. <laughs> You know, hey, yeah. we were trying to move him versus just, oh, we thought we'd hack him up and see, quote, if he were fat. I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means either, but... Like, it, couldn't you, like, see from the outside? Do you have to go in the inside? Right. Yeah, it, it's a very, very strange story. And what I think it might be is perhaps this Neil guy was not altogether, altogether. He was probably uh, unwell. He was known for violence and not being a good guy so perhaps this was just him okay i'm drunk i might as well give this a shot maybe he was just an asshole <laughs> or a psychopath yeah yeah the prosecution's theory was that the gruesome deed of butchering francois had been taking too long and was too arduous for the drunken pair and they'd just given up to conceal their crime neil and olivier had stuffed francois's body in the corner and put the sail over him they then fled stealing Coupard's valuables and supplies they'd need to make their escape, finally absconding with the dead man's fishing boat to flee to the English coast. The pair argued that they were blind drunk and didn't know what they were doing during the killing. Olivier, although a large bull of a man, was not known for violence, nor was he the sharpest tool in the shed. Olivier could not explain why Coupard had been killed. The older man, he said, had been nothing but kind to him. The court determined that Olivier had been a passive participant in Coupard's murder. They said it was Neil who'd initiated the whole thing and had manipulated the simpler man, Olivier, into his role. After a short deliberation, the court determined that with his admission of guilt as well as other mitigating circumstances, i.e. his intellectual difficulties, Louis Olivier was guilty, but would be sentenced to only 10 years of hard labor for his part in the crime. Auguste Neal was another matter entirely. Clearly the aggressor, Neal, was sentenced to death. Neal was jeered by the crowd as he was led back to the local prison by guards. He grinned and yelled, What are you looking at? Give me some tobacco. Neal appealed his death sentence the next day and it was upheld. Over the next few months, he made the usual appeals for clemency from the French governmental representatives in St. Pierre and Miquelon. As Neil's only defense was extreme drunkenness at the time of the crime, his final appeals for clemency were rejected in July of 1889. There had been other death sentences handed out on St. Pierre and Miquelon, but they had been commuted because of the lack of a means to carry them out. This time, Thanks to the brutal nature of Neil's crime and a rise in violent crime on the islands, the government wanted to make an example of Auguste Neil. The governor of St. Pierre and Miquelon, informed of the rejection of the appeal, asked Paris, by cable, to send to St. Pierre an executioner and his equipment, a guillotine, France's preferred method of execution in that era. According to Bois de Justice, contrary to popular belief, Dr. Joseph Ignace Guillotine was not the inventor of the machine. He was a medical doctor and lawmaker who in 1790 proposed that the death penalty should be equal for all, regardless of social rank and nature of the crime. It would be carried out by a swift mechanical device to eliminate suffering. His idea was derided at first, but later the National Assembly revived it and then adopted it in 1791. Primitive ancestors of the guillotine were used in Ireland, England, and Italy in the 14th and 15th centuries. Several known decapitation devices, such as the Italian Mananaya, the Scottish Maiden, and the Halifax Gibbet, were documented and may predate the use of the French guillotine by as much as 500 years. 
it was believed that this method was the only, quote, humane mode of execution which ensured the condemned a swift and painless death. The document making the death penalty by, quote, mechanical decapitation, the law of the land, was signed by, among others, King Louis XVI. Louis, ironically, two years later at age 38, on Monday, 21st of January, 1793, was himself beheaded by guillotine on the Place de la Révolution. Yes. It's like, let's make it humane. And then two years later, no, now it's time for me to get my head cut <laughs> off. There's your humane. All this talk about humane execution, mm -hmm. to me, really, it's about... I think allowing societies who have the death penalty to feel better about murdering people. Yeah. You know, to me, it's splitting hairs, the guillotine, stoning, electric chair, the noose, the firing squad, lethal injection, all the concern over like the 30 seconds of pain before you're ending somebody's life. Yeah. It's really seems to me like it's just societies that have the death penalty trying to make it more palatable. Right. And some places don't make it palatable at all. There are still places that stone people to death. Yeah. And you know how they do stoning now? Somebody is brought into a square mm -hmm. with others around to watch, mm -hmm. and they are tied in place, mm -hmm. and a dump truck is brought in with stones and dumped on top of them. No, oh, that's interesting. Mm hmm Yeah, I don't want to get into where that happens because it's an awful... Thing, but anyway yeah but so like it's, i just find it funny not funny but strange that everyone sort of gets all oh it has to be humane you're killing them yeah 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 regardless you're, you're still you're still killing a human being and i probably want a little bit of pain so i could feel something big before i don't feel anything anymore <laughs> yeah maybe oddly you know what i mean yeah i don't know you're not gonna feel anything ever again so hey make it count it's disturbing. It is. Like I'm 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 really grateful that the death penalty doesn't exist in Canada anymore. No. Uh, I mean Yeah, there's been some anyway. You no, know, I think locking somebody up for life is more of a punishment than Sure, because yeah, then you have to think about it every they have day. To think about it and it's like why give them the the easy way out in some ways. Yeah. Apparently it's less expensive to lock someone up for life than it is to kill them because the uh, appeals cost so much. Yeah, and you know, um, also the one thing you have to worry about is that justice isn't perfect. Yeah. And when you give a final solution like that to somebody's life, there's no going back. Regarding the Neil case, France's master executioner, Dieble, refused to travel outside of France to do his work, nor would he be sending his guillotine as it was needed at home. Arrangements were made to ship a guillotine from Martinique, a French colony in the eastern Caribbean Sea. <laughs> I picture this guy. I am an artiste. I am not going to the provinces to work my art, and my guillotine might get rusty from the Atlantic uh, salt water. Well, he, he himself didn't want to go because he had work to do <laughs> <laughs> yeah, back they, in France. They because were busy back in France. Busy chopping there. heads in yeah. France. And yeah, you're right. He probably, he didn't want to send his guillotine because A, that would mean he needed another. Yeah. And then B, yeah, probably wouldn't do some, fare so well, you know, like. Yeah. Yeah. That's his artistic tool. Exactly. So, so they got one from Martinique. Martinique, yeah. Where mm. they were probably beheading pirates up to that I point. I wonder if they like tested it first on a coconut. I doubt it. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> from com. The guillotine arrived on the island on August 22, 1889, and Neil was executed two days later by a pair of local fishermen of dubious reputation, who were paid 500 francs and given a pardon on a three-month petty larceny sentence after the governor failed to find an executioner among the local tradesmen and the military personnel stationed on the islands. The two headsmen were despised by the islanders for what they had done, and everyone refused to accept their blood money forcing them to leave the islands before the winter. The protocol followed standard French procedure, with the awakening before dawn, the mass, a glass of wine, and a bowl of tea, the toilette, 
a chew instead of the traditional last cigarette, and the ride in a carriage to Place de l'Admiral Corbet, where soldiers formed a square around the guillotine, and most of the population of St. Pierre had come to see the event. Neil thanked the Seagrists, the warden of the prison and his wife, for their care and told onlookers, learn this lesson. I killed, now I will be killed. Do not do like me. And then said to the executioner, do not miss, before the blade fell. Contrary to widespread reports, the execution was rather uneventful, although the head did remain attached by a thread that the executioner had to sever with a knife. The question of consciousness or awareness following decapitation remained a topic of discussion during the guillotine's use. The following report was written by Dr. Borio, who observed the head of executed prisoner Henri Languil on 28 June 1905. Here, then, is what I was able to note immediately after the decapitation. The eyelids and lips of the guillotine man worked in irregularly rhythmic contractions for about five or six seconds. This phenomenon has been remarked by all those finding themselves in the same conditions as myself for observing what happens after the severing of the neck. I waited for several seconds. The spasmodic movement ceased. It was then that I called in a strong, sharp voice, Languille! I saw the eyelids slowly lift up without any spasmodic contractions. I insist advisedly on this peculiarity, but with an even movement, quite distinct and normal, such as happens in everyday life, with people awakened or torn from their thoughts. Next, Languille's eyes very definitely fixed themselves on mine, and the pupils focused themselves. I was not then dealing with the sort of vague, dull look without any expression that can be observed any day in dying people to whom one speaks. I was dealing with undeniably living eyes which were looking at me. After several seconds, the eyelids closed again. It was at that point that I called out again, once more without any spasm. Slowly, the eyelids lifted and undeniably living eyes fixed themselves on mine with perhaps even more penetration than the first time. Then there was a further closing of the eyelids, but now less complete. I attempted the effect of a third call, but there was no further movement, and the eyes took on the glazed look which they have in the dead. The guillotine remained the official method of execution in France until the death penalty was abolished in 1981. The final three guillotinings in France before its abolition were those of child murderers, Christian Ranucci on 28 July 1976 in Marseille, Jerome Carrion on 23 June 1977 in Douai, and torture murderer Hamida Jandubi on 10 September 1977 in Marseille. Jandubi's death was the last time that the guillotine was used for an execution by any government. The guillotine used to behead Auguste Neil, called La Veuve de Saint-Pierre, now sits in Le Musée de l'Arche in Saint-Pierre and can be seen on the site boisdejustice.com, described in detail and photographed by that site's author. La Veuve de Saint-Pierre, what does that translate to? The widower of Saint-Pierre? Yep, I think so. And uh, interestingly, there's a really crappy movie with uh, Juliette Binoche uh, of the same name, and it's about roughly, very loosely based on this case, and it paints Auguste Neal as sort of a folk hero. Mm. You know, he's waiting in prison to be executed, and people uh, begin to sort of fall for him and, and think that maybe they shouldn't be executing him because he's a human. I can see, you know, that actually happening, but it isn't true in this case. The movie doesn't stick close to the actual story. Oh. They often don't. They often don't. Interestingly, perhaps today in Canada at least, Neil might have had a chance to avoid his conviction and subsequent execution. Just recently, in an extremely controversial decision, the Supreme Court of Canada made a ruling allowing criminal defendants in cases involving assault, including sexual assault, to use a defense known as self-induced extreme intoxication. According to a Global News article, quote, Effectively, it means defendants who voluntarily consume intoxicating substances 
and then assault or interfere with the bodily integrity of another person can avoid conviction if they can prove they were too intoxicated to control their actions. Quote, to deprive a person of their liberty for that involuntary conduct committed in a state akin to automatism, conduct that cannot be criminal, violates the principles of fundamental justice in a system of criminal justice based on personal responsibility for one's actions, wrote Justice Nicholas Casire in the unanimous nine-judge ruling. Under Section 33.1 of the Criminal Code, extreme intoxication, formerly known as non-insane automatism, cannot be used as a defense in criminal cases where the accused voluntarily ingested the intoxicating substance. The court's ruling declares that the section is unconstitutional. The court found that despite the laudable purpose of the criminal code provision, it runs afoul of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms because it is too broad. Quote, the legitimate goals of protecting the victims of these crimes and holding the extremely self-intoxicated accountable, compelling as they are, do not justify these infringements on the charter that so fundamentally upset the tenets of the criminal law the court said in the finding. With Section 33.1, Parliament has created a meaningful risk of conviction and punishment of an extremely intoxicated person who, while perhaps blameworthy in some respect, is innocent of the offense as charged according to the requirements of the Constitution. End quote. Victims' rights groups are, of course, outraged by the ruling which would lead to the overturning of verdicts in several well-known cases and, at the very least, new trials for those who might have used that defense at their original trials. So I, I feel mm-hmm. for alcoholics and addicts. Yes, me too, for, uh, because I personally am one of those. But at the same time, it's not, to me, it's not like, you know, being, like we've covered cases of schizophrenia and stuff. You've got yourself to that point. Yes, it's, and as, somebody who is suffering from a mental illness has not it's, voluntarily. It's different, yeah. Right? And it's like, I'm sorry you're an addict or an alcoholic. Mm-hmm. Um, and some of these cases they weren't there just drinking. But you made those decisions to get so out of your mind over that period of time that you hold responsibility. Like, I don't think we can, like, you know, I think al- addicts and alcoholics, they have to learn that their con- the consequences of yeah. doing what they're doing is their responsibility. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, it's, it's a so tough one. I don't have a lot of space for <laughs> yeah. people getting away because they're saying I was drunk. Mm-hmm. I don't actually have none. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm struggling with this one myself. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I do hope that they rewrite that part of the criminal code. That... Hey, why don't we just throw away every single drunk driving conviction ever? Right. Oh, I was drunk. Right. Right. Yeah, I was in a blackout. Like I don't recall. I don't recall running down that child in the yeah. road. Yeah. Like, let's throw them all out, guys, because oh, he wasn't responsible because he was drinking. Right. Mm. Yeah. This is this is the problem I'm struggling with with yeah. this one too. Yeah. And that's it for Dark Poutine episode 221, Murder on the Isle of Dogs, the execution of Auguste Neal. All the way from France. All the way from France. <laughs> little old, a little old piece of France off Newfoundland. I checked. You can get a flight for a thousand euros direct to Paris from St. Pierre. Really? Yeah. Well, that's pretty good. They have a little airline. Yeah. So cool. Well, they have a couple of airports there. It's, it's yeah. very neat. Yeah. I would like to see that place, obviously, because it's a little piece of France. And I actually quite like France. I like the French culture. And Well, most, most sort of, most of these sort of small little weird places that are owned by another nation mm-hmm. have airports and stuff like that beyond the people that live there because it's a way of saying, yeah, this is still ours, like, like Gibraltar and the United Kingdom. Sure, yeah. The, air, air, the, the it's so small the the runway goes right through the middle of yeah there's actually traffic lights and when the plane lands it's the main road you have to like stop and let the planes go by oh dear yeah that's that's kind of scary that's right it's time for voicemails 
You can leave us a message at 1-877-327-5786 or 1-877-DARK-PTN. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. Well, let's listen to our first voicemail. Fernanda, Mike and Matt, Anna Dree, Sitte Cree. Hi, Mike and Matt. It's Anna calling. For those who've worked in the barnyard, I am Bagel, an Iroh human slave. So I was just sort of in town visiting my mother back here in beautiful British Columbia, and I thought I'd give you guys a ring. So, you know what? I'm sorry for all those Welsh speakers out there, but then she in the hat, so go shit in your hat in Welsh. I am, once again, I'm so sorry, Welsh speakers. I'll catch you guys on the flip side and see you hopefully in London, Matt. Or, sorry, not Matt, Mike. Bye. <laughs> Oh, dear. She really wants me to visit London. Yeah, she, Hi, Anna. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think that's really funny. It's It sucks that we didn't get to see Anna when she was here, but she, yeah. it looked like a flying trip. She was here and gone again. But, yeah. But, <laughs> but yeah, you will definitely see me, and I am planning something with Michael from Murder Mile Walks. So, yeah, the Murder Mile podcast. It's going to be kind of fun. Hmm. Yeah. He does all the walks around London and takes people around the murder sites and stuff like that. So how many kilometers in a mile or vice versa? There's 1.6 kilometers in a mile. So it's a murder point, 1.6 kilometer. So <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Let's listen to another voicemail. All hail the king and queen of dark poutine. Uh, my name is Logan. I'm from Southern California, U.S. Uh, I'm a new pest control tech, and I wanted to give you guys a shout out and say thank you because I spend a lot of time alone and on the road at this job, and you guys have helped more than I could describe. And I wanted to bring up, I just listened to episode 210 of the podcast, and you and Matthew talk about how if you don't grow up in a multicultural environment, you have a hard time identifying people of other ethnicities and I just wanted to say that I know from personal experience that that's true I grew up in Lake Havasu City Arizona if you want to google it go right ahead uh, it gets about 120 in the summers and about 90 degrees at night so naturally everyone is everyone gets sun there everyone's pretty tan and until about six years old when I moved to California, I had no idea, one, that I was white, and two, that my neighbors weren't. Um, again, thank you guys for all that you do and bringing such a caring perspective to the victims and not just describing them as victims, but the real per people that they were. Uh, again, thank you guys for supporting me in the indirect way that you do. Uh, don't forget to take a shit in your hat. Well, thanks, uh, Logan. Thanks, Logan. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm so glad. You know, it always makes me happy when people talk about, you know, long days at work or mm -hmm. what they're doing and, yeah. and we're, we're in their ears helping them along. Yeah, for sure. I like that name, Logan. You know, my husband's all-time favorite movie is a movie called Logan's Run. Oh, my God. I love that movie with Michael York. 1976. Yes. Yeah. Logan, I love Logan, that movie. You, Logan, you should watch Logan's Run. It doesn't really hold up as far as the uh, special effects go. Uh, there are there are parts of that movie that are really... Uh, it, it shows its age when you watch at it the, now. At the time, it was the height. About, yeah. Well, yeah. But at the same time, it the story of it is is quite quite good. It's yeah. a, it's a decent decent movie. So Logan's Run for Logan. Yeah, give it a, give it a go, Logan. Give it a go. And it's interesting that he mentioned like not realizing other cultures because when you grow up in a place like that, it, it they're just folks. Yeah. It's interesting when you know. I respect that you know uh, people cultures will do different things and, and, yeah. and have different views and all that kind of stuff. But it's, it's kind of fascinating. I, I love the innocence of the child's mind yeah. for that, you know, and, and, and in a if, way, I if think we could we, just hold on to that. That'd be great. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't that be lovely? All right. We have one more voicemail. Let's have a listen. Hmm. 
Hey, Mike and Matthew. Long time listener, first time caller. I, I just wanted to say I really appreciated your last uh, episode about the bombing that never was. So I grew up um, in Victoria area and I met Amanda when I was about 14. And I knew her as Susie, so I'm going to just call her Susie from here on out. Yeah, we met at like a goth meetup <laughs> off of Live Journal or something like that. Um, and I just, I feel for her. Like, I really think people don't fall through the cracks. They're pushed through the cracks. And um, her mental health was has always been rough as long as I've been acquainted with her. And the way that I feel like the law enforcement really just tricked her and took advantage of somebody who's just been neglected by the system was atrocious to see. And the media was so brutal. I remember they posted pictures of one of Susie's ex-boyfriends who was not the guy she was working with. And it's just, they took no accountability for it. And they were slandering people's names, you know? Uh, So thanks for speaking true to just how awful this was. (laughs) It was a terrible situation. And I don't know the other guy, I'm forgetting his name now, but I just really wanted to speak to Susie. Like, she was troubled. And... I think she was really taken advantage of, and that's horrible. And now she's paying the price <laughs> forever. So, anyways, go shit in your hat. Thanks, guys. Thank well, you. Thank you. I, a little bit of perspective on humanity. She didn't and, leave her name, so I'm going to call her Victoria. Since, okay, Victoria. Since, since she said it was in Victoria. But interesting uh, about that, how, yeah, it. Th- this one really did disturb me. That episode really did disturb me. Um, yeah, obviously people have their, uh, responsibility for the things that they do, but when they're led to do the things that they do by the authorities. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, it's, it's, I think the, the woman in, in that story, Mm -hmm. um, there was less about, you know, most of the, the, most of the story that we covered was about him and what he was saying. Yeah, and I find you know uh, don't ca- I don't care if you're having some problems like saying anti-Semitic all these sorts of things is horrible. Yeah, but that doesn't mean you get you deserve to get pulled through and set up like this, right? Right. I did struggle with whether or not to name these people, and I think she was more sort of honestly. I have just felt she was more on the sideline of all of that. To mm-hmm. be honest, yeah, I did struggle with whether or not I should name. Uh, because it's been all so unfair, right? Okay. <laughs> I'm, are you, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, like, I I just wanted to finish my thought. Oh, go for it. Yeah. Um, I struggled with whether or not I should name the people involved in that case because they have been acquitted of the thing that they have been accused of having been led through it by the police. But I, I, I didn't think that naming them, you know, it's like the cat's out of the bag and people would have just been able to Google it and find it anyway. So yeah, yeah, I didn't feel like not naming them would make any difference to, uh, the amount of pain that they, they and their families have been through already. You know, I don't think it's going to make a difference. I think the way we told it is a good thing. Yeah, yeah I've struggled with that one a I lot. I think in a way, naming, even though it it actually focuses that they're real people. Yeah. It's sort of like how mm. if you win the lottery in this country, they, sure. they, they have to name you because they want people to know that it's real. I mean, it's sad and everything else, but mm-hmm. it's like if it became this whole nameless, we're not going to name them. Well, actually, no, they're real people. Yeah. Right. So in a, in a way, it's a, it's a story of warning for all of us. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. If somebody 
starts to befriend you and try to get you to do like even little criminal things and they just sort of seem to have come out of nowhere, it's probably the cops. <laughs> it's Mr. Big. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, dear. But I can't, I mean, yeah, I'm, you and I are in a position with um, a, a brain level <laughs> to, to never be able to be able to be pulled into these sorts of things. Anymore. I don't know. Like, I don't know. Like, I, I could be taken. Really? I, 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 to, to do illegal stuff like that? No way. No, probably not illegal stuff. But No way, I couldn't. But we, we're we suckered all the time, you know, like you're in advertising. You know darn well that we're being lied to. Truth well told. Yeah, right. Exactly. Exa but exactly. Mm. So how much of what we see on, on television, on the news is truth well told? You well, know? Uh, the, I, I actually believe that people need to read between the lines and everything. You have to decode this world for yourself. Well, I don't think everybody knows to do that. I, I think people blindly trust these organizations that are telling us the things well, that they're telling us. Wake up. But, but telling people to wake up, it's like the, the people who need, who I should, the people who may benefit from that statement, wake up, Yeah, probably aren't going to listen because they're believing the things that they've been told. Mm. Like they have no reason to want to wake up. There's, it's, it's, it's a very, belief is a very weird thing. If a politician is speaking, they're mm. most likely lying to you. Or just not. Most news yeah. organizations have a sway one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Check out different ones, left, right, center, and make up your own mind. It's th those are, th is that two or three easy rules right there? Yeah. And never, never, never believe advertising. Never. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> says the advertiser. That's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one 327 5786 or... 1-877-D-A-R-K-P-T-N. We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. All right, so it's time for Patreon and Donut Money donor shoutouts. And first up, a new patron in at the loony level. And it's crazy, like uh, Patreon doesn't allow us to do it in a way that it's, you know, one, two... One, two, five, ten dollars. Now they've added tax to it because, of course, just for fun. Well, I have to. Yes, I have to pay GST on all this. Uh. Yeah. Anyway, Sienna is our newest patron, and hey. she doesn't. We don't know where Sienna is from. So, where is Sienna from, Matthew? She's from Middle Fart in Denmark. Middle Fart in Denmark. Yeah. Haven't we had somebody from Middle Fart in Denmark Never. before? Are you sure? Absolutely. Okay. Um, other than fart, what does she do in Middle Fart? She is a seamstress. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so she's a seamstress from Middle Fart. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so Sounds like a good life. Sure. Does, does she have uh, a lot of... Uh, clients who she sews seams for or yeah, absolutely it's yeah. it's sort of the it's the capital for seamstry oh in interesting Denmark. well there you go middle <laughs> fart next we have taylor smith taylor smith and where is taylor from matthew gobbler's knob <laughs> are you sure yeah okay so <laughs> gobbler's knob it's where puxatani phil is Okay. Yeah. 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 It's a weather capital of the world. What state is that in again? That's in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. And Gobbler's Knob. So, yeah. So she's a, um, what do you call a weather person? Meteorologist. Oh, okay. Good. Just like Judy Coy. I was, I was hoping, hoping that it didn't have something to do with the name of the place. No, she's a meteorologist. Oh, good. And she poo poos this whole, um, idea of early wind, early spring of, and of, yeah. Gophers or whatever they are. <laughs> <laughs> groundhogs they're groundhogs okay but yeah that's kind of fun doesn't look like we had any donut money this week but that's okay 
I don't Ooh. need to eat. I don't need to eat. <laughs> uh, alas. alas and a lack. Tis what it is. Thanks to all our patrons and donut money donors, past and present, for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash darkpoutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening. And tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. And until next week, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. I really have to go pee, so we're going to say goodbye now. Okay, bye. Bye.